And uh, on Monday, we finished, uh, on Monday, we discussed a functor uh, and we discussed um, some of the properties of the monoid. So with the functor, you remember that we can F map a function over some sort of structure. Uh, and then the structure is called the functor. Uh, and then with the monoid, we have this ability to um, run because uh, monoid supports associative operations and they have identity. So we have this sort of uh, mechanisms for chaining things and reorganizing them internally without changing the semantics, without changing the behavior. All right, so we will do a small detour, but a detour because maybe is the simplest example of a state um, or of a value, which is kind of wrapped with some, some state, okay? Uh, and it's a good example to start because it's, it's the simplest. It's the simplest mechanism for encapsulating some sort of effect uh, together with the value that, you, that we're dealing with in, in our program. So first question to you, what is a total function? If you were reading a book, I think you will know. You may remember it from mathematics. Um, Tell me what is, what do we call a total function? Yeah, I know, it's early morning. Do you see the, the Menti? Is the Menti working? Hope it's working. <clears throat> okay, great. So any idea? Uh, so what is, so what, what is a function in general? Like if I, okay, so, a function which is defined for all inputs of the right type. That is for all of the domain. Perfect. That's the Google answer, and that's a correct answer. <laughs> a function defined for all of the domain. Yeah, perfect. So um, Googling is good. Sometimes Googling gives you good answers. And indeed, like a normal function, a f function is a mapping from um, the input domain to the output domain, right? Um, and the total function is a function which is defined for all the items in the domain such that it works for, for you know, all the elements. Um, so if I go to, uh, let's see. If I go to my, no, 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 this, okay. CI. So if I have if I have a function plus, for example, so if I say um, what is plus, then it says it's a function from a type. Uh, I, I, I actually, yeah, plus takes two arguments. So let's take um, let's take um, plus ten. So we have a un, un, unary function. Um, Possible indentation problems. What do you mean? That works. So that has to work. Yeah, okay, I was asking I. So this is a, a, a function which takes a number. And so the domain on the input is a number and the same type is on the output, right? So this is a function defined within the domain of numbers. Uh, uh, I could coerce it to an integer. Uh, and then I have a function which is from an integer to an integer, right? So the input domain, the domain on which that function is defined is integers. 
and then the, the the outcome is integer as well all right so that's that's kind of simple so the next question is if we have a function which is defined for the type a and produces some um, values of type b uh, what if there is an error what would happen if there is an error like in the execution of this function and we cannot really produce um, the, the output? What would we do? Um, well, you know, in the imperative programming, we throw an exception, uh, we return nil, uh, we have to deal with it. Somehow we have to deal with it, right? So in Haskell and in, in, in general in programming, Dealing with those exceptional situations, dealing with this kind of um, uh, situations where this mapping doesn't work uh, is a little bit cumbersome, right? It's a little bit problematic uh, because we have to do extra steps. We have to do some you know, additional behavior. And if you're programming in Golang, I don't know about you, but I am always really annoyed by this if error different than nil, right? Uh, almost every single line of code, you have to do this check. And it's super annoying. Um, so um, <clears throat> before we proceed, we have a question. Oh, come on. I am not looking at this page from more than one window. Or am I? I have it here. But they're not presenting that one. Uh, all right, so let's see. So which of those functions are not total functions? So there are some total functions and there are some non-total non functions. All right, so that is very nice. Um, why is plus a total function? Well, if I, um, wh when it will break down, it, it doesn't really break down, right? So plus is total function because if I give it integers, uh, and sum them, or if I, if I give them two numbers and sum them, I, I will always get a number. So there is no kind of exceptional situation. With division, there is, uh, because um, if I try to do one divided by zero, my program blows up, right? So for anything else, if I have anything else, it, um, crap, 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 sorry for that. So if I do, and in normal division, it works. If I do a uh, division by zero, then I have an exception, right? So suddenly my, my div operation, my division function um, is not total because not for all the inputs, it works. It, it has this kind of exceptional input and for that exceptional input, it doesn't work. It just blows up, right? So um, that's why div is not a total function. How about tail and head? When tail and head blows up? So Frederick has an idea that it blows up for an empty list. And if we try that, so if I try a tail of two elements, <clears throat> of course, it's going to work. It's going to give, give me a list, which is the tail, right? How about if I only have one element? Well, it still works. It gives me an empty tail because, um, because this list is sort of the same as uh, one cont with an empty list, right? Uh, those two, like, <laughs> this is a syntactic sugar, just syntax shortcut for this right so that works because the tail is this empty list 
So if I try to do tail of an empty list, that again blows up. It throws me an exception, right? So, and similar with, with head, right? So head of an empty list blows up, head of the list with one element gives me that element. So indeed, um, tail and head are not total because within the domain, there is an element, which is a legal domain element, which is an empty list. Uh, and the functions are not defined for that element. Um, so that, that means, yeah, so also uh, Susan has a good point that if we have, uh, if we have uh, a list uh, which is like this, an infinite list, and we try to tail it, <laughs> that will also not work. So not only for empty lists, but also for infinite lists, uh, we have a little bit of a problem. Uh, so if I try to do ahead of this infinite list, that will work. If I try to take uh, five elements of that infinite list, it will work. But if I try to get a tail, uh, that will not work. Uh, well, it's sort of, it sort of works in a sense that I can do something with it. So I can say, uh, give me F, which is the tail of infinite list and it will kind of work. And now F contains um, um, a list which starts from two and goes towards infinity. So I say for tail of infinite list, it actually works. Like uh, it, you cannot like, you know, do processing on it, but it doesn't blows up. It does, doesn't blow up. It doesn't give you an exception. So it is defined. The, the behavior is defined, right? So uh, let's say for the infinite list, tail actually properly uh, returns uh, a value. All right, so let's see what, what I have here. Oh, come on. <clears throat> so we have some the reshuffling in the in the leaderboard. All right. So um, before we go back to to maybe. So now um, the benefit of total functions is that the behavior is well defined, right? So what when when we started um, when we started dealing with programming uh, with assembly, uh, we had um, we have a code which was sort of like, you know, uh, some, some statement, statement, uh, statement with some uh, go-tos. And we were kind of sequence of instructions and every instruction was doing something. And then if there was an erroneous situation, we had to do some if, if checks, right? So that's how it looked like in assembly. And that's, you know, how it looks like in Golang where we do, you know, we always do, crap like this, right? We do, okay, uh, there is a statement. Um, and then if there is an error, we have to say, if error is not uh, nil, then we have to deal with it, right? Uh, we can do some, some kind of um, more, um, a little bit more compact representation of it, but in, a, in effect, we have to kind of do this, right? So when we have a statement and that statement is not a total function, which means it can throw an exception, then we have to, you know, um, decorate it with this extra, extra things. So what if I have a total statement and it is defined for all the elements? Well, suddenly the code is kind of much simpler because it, you know, it looks like this, right? It's like statement, statement, statement. And I, I don't have to decorate it with all this kind of crap. Um, in Java and in other programming languages, you may have a try and catch, right? Uh, blocks for catching this exceptional behavior and, and so on. But as you see, the more we can do with total functions, the simpler the code looks like. And in, in, in Haskell, we always aim at eliminating all the possible exceptions and having only total functions such that our code kind of looks like this, that our code looks clean. Um, in some programming languages, uh, you 
have certain uh, syntax and you have certain uh, mechanisms to achieve similar things. So for example, in, uh, in, in Rust, uh, yeah, I, I will talk about it later. So that, what I'm trying to say is that total functions make programming much simpler. And then for uh, functions which are, which are not total, uh, what you can do is you, we, we try to drop them in such a way that they actually return, um, return things. So even in Golang, um, let's say I have some, um, I have some statement uh, and I'm, I'm calling it and it, it, I expect it to return a person, right? So uh, I want a person back and potentially there is an error, error back, right? So I will write statement like this and this function will always return me a person, right? Um, it, it's not like this function will not return a person. In, in C or C++, you could have a situation where this, um, let, let's call it like um, uh, <clears throat> make new person, some sort of factory function. And then let's say um, there is an error. So for some reason, um, I don't know, the database connection is broken and so on. So if, if, this, if this was a statement in uh, C++, you could return a nil, right? So, so you could say uh, null actually. No. So you could say, yes, I, I, I want the P to be a person, but because this failed, I get here a null, right? So you, you will say person is null. Uh, so that would be C++. That was, you know, we, we going away from this. It, it, it's, a, it's kind of a bad uh, situation to have something being a null. So in Golang, uh, you, you don't have this. Um, in a sense, you do have it, but it's a little bit more um, it's a little bit more enriched. So if I say person uh, make new person in Golang now, uh, I will always get a person. And if the person cannot be created, I will get a uh, a person which is actually not null, but it is uh, kind of an empty person, right? So the, the struct which the, the person is represented by, uh, it has sort of a nil value, but it's a kind of an empty non-initialized structure, which is considered to be a um, null, but I can still fill that up, right? So even though I get a person which is null, I can always say person name and I can assign it, you know, I can say, yeah, it's, it's Mariusz now, right? Here, I cannot do that. I cannot say person name uh, or, you know, if, if it was a pointer person name and I cannot do anything with it because it's now, I will get, you know, exception. Uh, so in Golang, you can already see we're going away of dealing with empty values and erroneous situation. This way, we kind of doing it this way, that, that this is already rich in type. And in addition, we do this by uh, usually connecting this error thingy, right? So then I know if there was an error, then this will be null, right? Sometimes we, we don't do that and we say, okay, if I got an empty person, that means it was erroneous. I don't know why, but sometimes we want this uh, situation and then I will get this, right? So as you see, like with this function, this function is not total function because uh, sometimes it doesn't produce, um, I mean, th this function actually in Golang is total function because it always produces a person, but sometimes that person is not initialized. It's just kind of nil. Um, and then we represent it by this errors um, situation. So we have sort of um, like, we can sum it, sum it up uh, as a situation where we have some sort of value we have a, a value plus we have some information uh, if this value is correctly created or not. So we have this binary state which says it was created correctly or not, right? So it, it is kind of like a bool, uh, true or false, right? Th there was an error or there was not, no error, right? Um, so it's, uh, we, have, we have it with the, uh, this situation we have with the map in, in Golang, 
where we get this okay for the check if the particular value is in a map, right? So here we get a value and then okay boolean, uh, which says no, the, the value is nil and the item was not in the in the thing, right? So you, you have uh, the kind of a progression for errors. Um, errors, so the, the kind of a first item is the boolean, which tells you there was an error, but you don't know what error was it, right? And that's uh, where in Golang, that's where we use this okay, uh, you know, parameter, like a boolean okay parameter for certain error situations. And then the second one is a kind of a struct, right? So there was an error and in Golang, Golang, that's the error situation where error represents some sort of a struct and gives you some sort of state about the error, right? So this is how um, we, we see, we have it in Golang. And then in Haskell, the, the basic situations that the kind of the situation one is basically the maybe, right? So it encapsulates an optional value. So what it means is that the value may not have been created. The value might not work because there was an error. And it is kind of, you don't know what type of error was it, uh, uh, what happened, but it tells you, you know, in a kind of a true or false way, no, the, you know, the, the value is not there, right? So a maybe contains a value of a particle type, uh, and it is uh, represented by this uh, data constructor just and the value, or it's empty. Uh, so we basically have this equivalent of this, right? Um, so if we have a look, uh, maybe is defined as, it's of course polymorphic, so we can define it on any type that we want, so it can store a value of any unrestricted type. Um, and the definition is maybe A, and then it is a, um, it is a, a data type which has uh, nothing. There is no encapsulating value. It, it just tells you that there is nothing or it encapsulates a value in the correct state and it says just A. Um, and if you go into data maybe uh, package, you will see that there are two or oh, three um, three functions. Um, two of them map the uh, the maybe type into a bool. Um, so the domain is um, a maybe, and then the result is bool. And the last one kind of extracts the value out of us, right? So the last one extracts the, the contained value out of this kind of container and gives us the value directly. And it's called from just. So question to you, how those, so let, let's, uh, let's kind of have a, a quick play with this. Um, so if I go to CI and I say, okay, I have uh, just 10. Okay, so let's say my value is just 10. And then if I say is just V, what should I get? Um, well, I will get true, right? Because V is the, the just side, right? Um, yes, I need to do module plus data maybe. And indeed, if I ask is just V, I, I, I'm getting true. And then if I say is nothing V, then I should get false, right? and it gives false and then I can extract the 10 by saying from just. So from just converts my V value, which is just 10 and extract me what was inside. So now question to you out of those, those three functions, is there any function which is non-topo? Or, are all the functions topple functions? That's right. So Thomas and uh, Frederick uh, have got, got it right. 
Um, those first two functions are total functions. They will always map maybe to a bool. Uh, this one is not. Uh, why? Because what will happen if I have nothing? So if I say uh, value nothing and it's nothing, uh, and then I say from just on VN, right? That will blow up. I again, I have an exception. Uh, so as you see, um, that function is not total because it's only defined on maybe type, um, which is the just side. But if I ask, okay, what type is from just? It says it should work for any maybe. For any maybe A, it will work, right? So if I ask what is nothing, it says, well, nothing is maybe A, right? So nothing is a, is a correct element of this domain, but this function doesn't work for that element. So that means, you know, it's broken. That means that function is not total. All right, great. So we have um, functions, you know, from A to B and it can fail, right? So then how can we turn it into a function which never fails? Well, we turn it into this, right? So if we have a situation uh, like, for example, like for example, the division, right? Uh, we have a division and the division fails for something. It fails for zero, right? So we have a function diff, which is defined for all the integers with the exception of a very specific integer and then it blows up, right? So if we want not to have this blowing up, if we don't want to have exceptions in our, in our code, what we can do is we can turn a function which goes from A to B into a function which goes from A to maybe B. And then this function will be total because it will always work because for those cases where it was blowing up, it will communicate to us that it kind of failed, right? So, um, we could turn, uh, so we can quickly turn as division. So let's say I want to have um, uh, my division and then it is, uh, um, I want it to work in such a way that I can call three divided by zero, right? So let's define my division that takes A and B. And then it says if B, is zero, uh, we um, we return uh, we return nothing, and then if else we uh, return just um, a divided by b. Let's see if I read. Yes, I hate this. Um, I don't remember how you do the indentation in the, yeah, let's do it. I, I don't remember how you how you do it here. So let's do it in the code. So if I go project 2002 Pasco, hello Pasco. No uh, source. Let So I will export my diff and then let's do here. So I will have my diff is defined. It takes, it takes A and produces A, but so it takes a number and produces a number, but we don't produce a number because then we will fail for um, for zero, but we do this. So my diff is 
my diff a and b. And if b is zero, uh, oh yeah, I forgot then. That's what I forgot there. Uh, so then nothing, then it will actually work in one single line. Um, else just um, a divided by b. Right, so, okay. Some problems, but let's see, stuck to ACI. Um, yeah, 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 of course. So it says, um, uh, so. I have, we have two arguments. Yeah, so Frederick noticed that I need them uh, and I didn't notice. Thanks, Frederick. Uh, and here we need to say we take two arguments. So come on, come on, come on. So we have to say we take two numbers. Okay. So let's reload this. Um, now what do you don't like? Yeah, so they have to be integral uh, because I cannot do the integral division on floats. So that's the problem here. So if we go, if we go here and say actually we can only do that on integral, on integral numbers. Perfect, so now I can do this um, three, um, what, I exported it, did I? Yeah, I exported it in lib, but we didn't import it the lib. Yeah, so now, so now you see, um, our division, even though it works like a normal division, so it returns the normal division, it's wrapped inside a maybe, and then it doesn't blow up if I try to divide it by zero, but it kind of communicates to me that there was an error and it just returns nothing. So now um, if I ask for my diff definition, it says it's a function which takes you know, two integral numbers, and produces a maybe number, but this is a total function now. It will never break. It will never like throw out exception or it will not misbehave. So we have kind of a, we turned an unsafe and uh, you know, exception producing function into something that is not exception producing and it is contained within this container. Uh, noticeably, I, I kind of deleted it, uh, but as I was um, as I was showing before, we have th those kind of uh, situations where we represent it as a bool, right? So that was the very simplest uh, possible thing. Um, it's this kind of okay check in, in Golang. And now um, we have this kind of an exception uh, or error uh, where we have a more semantic information of what went wrong, right? So we are kind of here. It's the simplest possible way of dealing with, uh, with problems. Uh, it basically communicates something went wrong. 
you don't know what uh, and why, but you know that something went wrong if you get to this nothing, nothing value, right? Okay, so why we do that this way? Uh, and what is the advantage of this way versus the Golang okay way with the bool, okay? Um, well, uh, first benefit is that we can apply functions on top of the broken items, right? So if, um, if we go to Golang, right? So if I, if I have my, this person case, right? So I'm getting a person and potentially I have an error. And then I do something like um, manipulate person, okay? So we are manipulating a person and we're passing a person into this function. And then this function returns us a new person, right? And this function can fail, right? So now I have, um, let's call it P1. And here I kind of return the manipulated person and it's P2, right? And because this function is not total, I, it can fail. Uh, so now um, if I need to do two op operations on this, so I have manipulate one, uh, and now I need to manipulate, okay, manipulate two. Um, and I need to ask, I need to do it on P2 and get P3, right? I can do this. And this again, potentially can produce an error for me, but see how, how the code looks like. So here I need to, to put this uh, error decorations, decorations already, right? Here I need to put, um, error decorations. And here at this point, if this was an error, this makes no sense because P2 doesn't have that information about that there was an error. That information is external to P2, right? So even though this function will produce me a P2, it will be an empty person, it, you know, th this, this P2 at this point, if there was an error, P2 will equal to a kind of an empty nil, nil person struct, right? Uh, but this P2, even though it's an empty, empty person struct, doesn't tell me that there was an error. Maybe this empty person struct is a correct value, right? I don't know here that there was an error. I only know here because there is this extra state. Uh, so at this line, if there was an error, this line semantically makes no sense because uh, P2 is incorrect, so I cannot have it like this. And because I cannot have it like this, what happens here is I will check if error is not nil uh, or, or, or if error is nil, then I can do this. I can do this behavior, right? So I need to mess up my code in such a way that I, this line here makes sense because it's only done if there was no error. Do you get it? So it, it is kind of messy. It's already very messy. I'm, I'm just doing two calls, right? I'm manipulating person twice and my code already looks terrible. Like it's, it's already a nightmare, right? Uh, so with maybe the situation is much simpler because we can change the functions. And by changing the functions, we propagate that there is an error and it kind of works um, in, a, in a very clean composable way. Uh, so the code conceptually now looks like this. I'm getting P2 uh, out of calling uh, M1 person, uh, M1 person. So I'm processing a person the, for the first time. Uh, so I'm processing the person one and I'm getting P2 and P2 contains the information if the processing was correct or not. Now this one is a total function. It always works, but it carries the state with it. And now if I do P3 uh, and I call M2 person P2, that call is semantically correct because at that line, I know if there is an error or not because that information is carried with it inside P2. So P2 communicates to this method whether there was previously an error or not. And then this method goes here, right? It returns me a value, which again communicates whether there was an error or not. So at the end of this, if I return P3, whoever needs to use P3 will also get the information if there was an error or not. And this is very clean. It's very composable. 
right? I can kind of chain those things in you know multiple ways, and then um, I don't need to do all this messiness in my code because this messiness is encapsulated inside the value itself, and it's super beautiful, right? It's super simple, like you know, compare this code to this code, and it's only two two statements. It's only two calls, and it's already like messy. Right, and we're not doing anything complex. We're just calling two simple functions to, to do something on the data. Um, and this code is much cleaner, much more composable. And imagine a, a, you know, a function which has like you know, 20 statements. Suddenly reading this is much cleaner and much easier than going over all this logic and like tra tra tracking, oh, is this error for that error? Sometimes you have error one, error two, and, and sometimes you have nested ifs, it's kind of a mess. And I'm not talking complex code. I'm just call, talking about calling two functions, right? And because this clearly wins, this mechanism clearly wins compared to this, uh, some modern programming languages, noticeably not Golang, uh, use it and in Rust and in Kotlin, you will see that if you have methods which can, you know, which can produce an error, you can kind of uh, cleanly call your methods as if there was no error. And if there was an error, the method will kind of shortcut and it will return the error outside without you doing all these messy checks. Um, there are proposals in Golang to do this, to include um, additional mechanisms which would make Golang code look more like this and look more like Kotlin and Rust code. Uh, but unfortunately, up to now, the designers of Golang, they said, now we like, you know, simplicity. <laughs> Surprisingly, like to me, this is much simpler than this, but yes, there is a little bit more semantic complexity of what happens behind the scene, how those values are kind of a, a little bit more complex because they encapsulate this state, right? So this composability is a big deal. Uh, I cannot stress it enough. So I will uh, Google uh, composability for you. And um, if you go to, to, to uh, Wikipedia, it says um, composability is a system design that deals with interdependencies of components. And then a highly composable system provides components that can be selected and assembled in various combinations to satisfy um, requirements. And this um, composability, like this ability to compose more complex things out of simple things is uh, fundamental in, in programming. And in this particular case, you see there is no composability. Like I cannot easily compose M1 and M2, uh, M1 person and M2 person, because I have this external state spilling over and I have to do this manual checks of how to compose them. They are not easily composable. Whereas here there are, in, in fact, what you can do, uh, you know, you, you can do this. Um, you can say, I want to call M2 person on top of the result of this thing, and it will work with no if statements, right? I mean, it, it is composable because I can do this processing and then do this processing, and then all the error propagation, all the state propagation happens, is kind of encapsulated inside the the state which is which is passed from one function to another that is impossible here i cannot call um, you know <laughs> I, I cannot call m2 on the result of m1 first of all because m m1 returns two things and m2 just takes one thing right and m, m2 only takes person but this one returns person and the error right so this this behavior is not composable whereas this behavior is composable um, all right, so composability, you can read a little bit more on, on that. Um, and it is it is big deal. And because it is big deal, you can see it in, in other programming languages. Uh, and it is kind of making its way into um, uh, dealing with, um, with this. So, okay, so let's have a, a short break. And then I will show you how we sort of did it already with this person example, but we will reiterate it a little bit with this uh, simple example of uh, doing uh, manipulation of on two numbers, right? So 
if you think about it, you can you can do it in the break. You can try to write a simple function in Golang. You, you don't deal with the IO, right? So we, we don't want to deal with IO. So we assume you got a number from a user and it could contain an error. And then you want to add 10 to it. You want to multiply it by two and you want to convert it to string. So we need three functions and we need to compose them and how this would look like in Golang and how this will look like in Haskell using the uh, maybe type. Right, so let's let's have a break, and then um, I will uh, show you how it looks like with the. Uh, so let's have what is what we normally have. We normally have uh, ten minutes, so let's do nine minutes. Uh, And we will see each other shortly. So that's the timer, and that's the um, that's the homework. So get a number from a user, add ten to it, multiply it by two, and then convert it to a string. Three simple things that we will do on this input, on this. Um, number from the user, right? And remember that the number from the user can can break, right? It can, user can uh, give us uh, a wrong input or um, we may have problems like uh, converting it.
Okay. So let's go back to our simple example. So this is sort of like a test. You can keep it in a keep it keep in mind, and then every time you're learning new programming language or you you kind of doing something in in a new new system, new programming environment, ask, can I do this in a single line? Can I get an input from the user, convert it, um, which you know it it um, it does some sort of I/O. Um, convert it to a number. So you need to do a transformation of it, which can produce an exceptional error again. And then can I do three operations on it? Um, we, could, we could even use, um, we could even do something here with um, that this number is kind of used as a division. So then we could even have this, uh, you know, divide by zero exception as well. And then can I do all of this? Can I do those four things or five things in a single line? of code right um and if you cannot that means you will have to deal with all the boilerplate you will have to deal with all the kind of auxiliary things which are not part of the domain so here this is the spec and we don't care about handling uh like giving the user very meaningful error messages we just care about this always work and very nicely failing like it's not crashing our program it's not throwing exceptions it's not panicking it's just kind of a silently like um you know uh in a in a civilized way failing if the user input is wrong but if the user input is correct it will do what it needs to do right so in the in the case of kind of golang or imperative programming uh you will your code will look kind of like this. So to get a number, you have to use um, either some sort of a read operation or maybe scan, scan operation. Uh, and then th those operations can uh, fail. If you're using scan, you have to do some, um, some error decoration here. Uh, and then if you're doing read, you have to do some error decorations. Um, and then you have to do ASCII to integer, uh, and then you again have to do some error decorations, right? And then uh, decorations. And then if um, you're doing scan, you have to do this. And then once you have this sort of a value, uh, so you, you know, at the end of that sequence with kind of a little bit of complexity already there, you have a value. And then on the value, you're doing something and you cannot, like you, you do one, two, three things, and then you cannot really chain them. You cannot kind of uh, chain them in a single single fashion because you may have to deal with kind of error uh, decorations uh, in after each of that. And the composability is a little bit broken, right? So that's how it would kind of look like in, um, uh, in Golang. Uh, which, which is, you know, noticeably the the, the most uh, pain in the ass um, situation actually. So in in here we need to do uh, three things, right? So one thing is we need to um, we need to add ten to it, and then we need to mul multiply it by two. So I, of course I can do all of that in a single line, but just to um, simulate that this is actually a more complex logic we will kind of do uh at that we're adding 10 to it so at 10 will be a function which um so what, what do we want uh we want um at 10 to be a function which takes a, a maybe int um and produces um maybe int right so it takes a maybe number because as we know like the user input can fail so we have to deal with that with that case so we, instead of passing int directly we're passing maybe int so we take maybe int and we produce maybe int uh and we basically do um f map on the argument right so this is uh called point three notation so i can add this argument here i have an argument a an argument a here but uh because they are both here and here at the end i can kind of delete it 
So my function definition will be a little bit more terse. And it says, this is a function which takes you know, one argument and then this is called on that argument. So I don't need to specify that argument because it, it is basically what, what is passed here, right? And then we do the same for mul multiply by two. So we have uh, maybe int and we have maybe int. And because um, I'm doing this maybe ints, uh, it is nice if you define, uh, let, let's, let's define our own type and we say it's my data. And my data in our case, it's very simple because it's a maybe int, but you could, um, you could have a more complex, uh, you could have more complex types and you can have some more complex, maybe of some kind of very complicated thing. And then you don't want to be repeating it all over the, all over the place. So again, in our case, it's so simple that you can just inline it. But in the normal case, you probably want to define your own data types. And you're kind of doing those type aliases by, in, in Haskell by, by calling type. So now what we do is, you know, I have my data, which is converted to my data, right? So I have my data as input and my data as output. Um, my data is input, uh, my data as output and multiply, uh, that's again trivial. So uh, we applying multiply, come on. Oh, come on again, I have this, where is my keys? Where is the multiplication sign? Old laptops, different keyboards, annoying. Okay, so I have it multiplied by two. <clears throat> and then the final step is um, convert to string. Again, which takes my data and produces my data. And this convert to string is fmap show, right? So as you see, <clears throat> those, those are very trivial cases. Like it's, it's really, really simple, but you can imagine this being kind of a more complex body. Like we're doing more complex logic here and this being kind of a more complex type. So now having those, um, those three functions defined and I will export them. So um, at 10, uh, move to convert to string. Okay, so uh, we have them. And now I will go um, to stack GCI. Ma data, uh, typos, typos, typos. My data. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe this will work. Yeah, cons is um so let's see. Yeah, so um, this one is slightly different. So um, it actually takes my data, which is maybe int, and it produces maybe string, right? So that one, um, I need to introduce a new type because I'm kind of changing the box. Like I'm not changing the box, the box is maybe, but I'm changing what I'm holding in the box. So far I've been holding ints in my box, but now I'm kind of holding a string. So I need to um, update that. There, um, okay, so let me see. Convert, yeah, that's good, thanks. So Sander noticed my typo here. So let, let's change it here. So I will call it conv convert to string. All right, so this way. 
All right, let's see now. Uh, small two. Mul mm, two, yeah, let's see again, probably some sort of typo. So mul two, mul two, mul two, yeah. Uh, mul two, okay. Sweet, let's see. Compiles, so let's have a quick look again. So um, I just defined three functions. One is adding number 10. The other one is multiplying it by two. And then conversion converts what we have inside the box from maybe int to maybe string, right? So now I need to load the lib such that I have them. And now I can, of course, try them in isolation, right? So if I have a number, which is uh, just 10, I can say uh, mul2 n and it works. I can call uh, at 10 on n and that works as well. Yeah, because 10 plus 10, it happens to be the same number. Uh, and I can also compose it, right? So I can say, I can add 10 and I can multiply by two. And now I have a single function, which does both of those things on the parameter that I pass, right? So I can call this function f and I can call f on n, right? So now it's 40 because I'm adding 10 and multiplying by two, right? Uh, and now not only the composability is easy like this, but also this error propagation is, is easy because I can now um, apply my f, my kind of, uh, oh yeah, and we also have one more. So I can also combine f so let's do this um, con s, right? So now I can do f of n and uh, previously I got 40 as a number and now I'm getting 40 as a string, right? So I kind of composed all three into a, a simple sequence. And now what I can do is I can use a building uh, mechanisms in, um, in uh, in Haskell, so what I can do is I can um, um, will get line work. Yeah, so get line will work. So I can get the line from a user, and then once I get the the line, I need to convert it to a number, and that can fail, right? So to convert um, to convert something to a number, we use read, right? So I if I if I say this. Um, it will try to parse the string into a value, uh, but if it cannot, it will fail. And I have to tell it what value do I expect out of this uh, such that it knows how to treat this string, right? So if I tell it, I, I expect an int, it will parse it and gives, give me an int, right? So this is kind of like scan or some, some uh, uh, ASCII to int in, in Golang, right? Uh, but you need to specify, you have to tell the, um, the runtime system, what do we expect out of this? Because this is polymorphic. Um, this call is polymorphic. So it can give you, it will try to give you a value of any type that you coerce it to, but it doesn't know upfront. Is it an int? Is it a float? Is it what, what do you want, right? Uh, so what will happen if I don't say it, it will kind of say, well, uh, I don't know how to parse it because uh, it's so polymorphic, you know, it will throw an exception, right? But if I coerce it, it will work. The problem is that even if I coerce it and the user produced like a uh, 10, it will fail, right? Because this is not an int. And it says, well, I cannot parse it because you tried, you told me to parse it as an int, but it's not an int. So there is an exception, right? So. How can we make read a total function that it doesn't throw exceptions? Well, we know how. We have to convert. Um, we have to convert this a value, which is readable. So you see, it, it is constrained to types that are readable. Uh, so the a has to be of readable type class. So it cannot be anything. 
but most of the things are readable, right, in, in Haskell. Um, so it converts a string to this readable A, but it can fail, right? So what we want, we want a function which is like this, but produces maybe A, right? So let's see. Let's go to um, let's go to Google. Google. Uh, I don't see the not Google. 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 And let's search for a method which is like this, but instead of A, and see, I got a read if I search for this type, but I want a maybe A. And voila, there is something that we need. We need read maybe, and it's defined in text read. And it basically is the same as read, but it takes a string, but instead of producing A, it is producing maybe A, right? Perfect, that's exactly what we want. So if I add a read, uh, text read, and I ask, okay, read maybe. It says, well, it takes a string and produces maybe A. So that's exactly what we want. So now if I say read maybe, I will, um, yeah. So now I cannot coerce it to give me an int because read maybe returns and maybe A, maybe A type, right? So I have to coerce it to a maybe end. And voila, it, instead of throwing an exception, it gives me nothing, right? So now if I have a correct value, it gives me a number, but if I have an error, if the user typed in something wrong, I get nothing, right? So now I have this uh, sequence of simulating I'm getting stuff from the user and I can uh, chain it with my F, right? So what was F? F was my data and producing a maybe string. And let's see. Uh, couldn't match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So that, that, that one was correct. I am coercing. I don't need to coerce the entire thing to maybe int. I only need to coerce the reading to maybe int. Um, and I need to coerce it to my data. And the bracket. Um, and my data is not exported. So we need to export my data as well. It's great. All right, so let's see. Reload. Um, ah, because I reloaded it, I we lost F. So F was okay, that's fine. So let's let's not do F, let's do let's do multiply no first was at 10 um my data right so we need to do this so if i Right, so this right-hand side here simulates us getting a data from the user input. So the user input gives us a data and we wrapping it into a maybe data. And this, in, in fact, my data is uh, maybe int. So this will give us a maybe int. 
So if it gives us uh, maybe 10 and we add 10 to it, we end up with uh, just 20, right? So it works. And then the composability works because we can chain this manipulations of the state, manipulating, sorry, manipulations of the value. Um, so we can mul multiply it by two. And at the end, we can convert it to a string and we can do all of that uh, on top of this user input, right? And if the user input is correct, we getting the correct value out of the processing. And then if the user input is incorrect, uh, we, it doesn't crash, it doesn't throw an exception, it doesn't break, it, all those things are still total functions. They just kind of uh, give us the, the nothing because we have an error. We have an error in that line here, which returns nothing. And then nothing is nicely propagated through all this processing, right? So as you can see, I can have a certain uh, user input and I need to, or, or something that can potentially fail. Uh, and then uh, I'm doing other things that again can potentially fail, uh, but I have this kind of a state propagation throughout my chain, throughout the chain of, of those processing. And I don't have any if statements, I don't have any try catch, I don't have if error is not nil. It is kind of nicely happening because I have this encapsulated inside the value itself, right? So that works really well and it's very compact and it's very terse. So I can do all of that in a single line, right? You will not be able to do that in C++ or in Golang, or uh, you will not even be able to do that in, in Rust actually uh, in a single line because, um, uh, you know, in Rust, the maybe type, so um, if I ask what is maybe, uh, we see that maybe is a semi-group and maybe is a functor. Uh, and in, unfortunately in Rust, for example, uh, the maybe type which exists in, 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 in Rust is not a semi-group and it's not a functor. And you cannot do this kind of a nice uh, chaining, this composability, right? Um, so that's what, that's what we reached so far. Um, and this example kind of demonstrates the power of not only the, the simple maybe type, which exists in other programming languages, but also if the maybe type is made into a monoid and into the functor, uh, because then you have those kind of extra properties and it allows you to sort of compose uh, more complex behaviors out of the simpler, simpler behaviors. All right, so composability, I, I cannot stress it enough. That's, that is a big deal. It is really a big deal. And the power of your kind of programming language, the power of your tool comes from the simple uh, fact if it is composable or not, right? Uh, so one, one uh, easy element that we've already learned is, um, so let's click that. Let me go to this. Um, so one, one very simple element that we've already learned um, is a difference between expressions and statements, statements, right? Statements. So the question to you, uh, why it is a big deal? Why knowing the distinction between expression and statements is important? And why, um, why, for example, if is not a statement in Haskell? It is an expression, why? And ideas? Answer is trivial. The answer is super trivial. So 
statements statements are not composable i cannot compose more complex statements out of the simple statements um, expressions are composable i can compose more complex expressions out of the simpler expressions right that's what you know um think about this so plus right imagine that those operations are not expressions but they are statements in a language and you have to use them the same way as you have to use um um I don't know, like def in Python, right? So def in Python or uh, function function definition, like some fun, uh, those are expressions, uh, th th those are statements in the language and if statement in, um, in C++ or for loop or while and so on, those are all statements and you have to use them in a specific way and you cannot compose them um, to produce and more complex statements. Whereas with expressions, you can build arbitrary complexity out of composing kind of expressions uh, and chaining them one into, into another, right? So uh, if statement in C or Golang is an expression in uh, Haskell, because that allows you to compose it into kind of a functional constructs, it, it, it allows you to comp compose it into more complex uh, expressions. All right, so so far so good, but that's not kind of enough uh, for propagating error, right? So here we've seen uh, that for uh, yeah I deleted it, but uh, for something that was uh, uh, giving us an error, we basically got nothing. We said, well, the program runs, the program behaves in kind of a total way, but and we know there was an error, but we don't know what. We don't know if one of those instructions failed or whether the, the parsing failed or whether the user, like maybe there was a timeout, maybe you were trying to read input from a network and the network timed out. So the, we didn't even get the input to be converted to the, to the integer, right? Um, so we don't know what, what went wrong. We just know something went wrong. So often that's not enough. Sometimes it's enough. And for simple cases like this, that's enough. But sometimes we need to know what went wrong. So then uh, we have a little bit more complex type, which is called either B. And either B is basically the same as, um, it's pretty much the same as maybe, but instead of the right side being just the value uh, and the left side being nothing, we say, okay, the left side, the nothing side will carry a certain value also, right? So. We now have a container on both sides. We have a container on the right side and left side. And you know, in Haskell, it is literally called left and right side. Uh, and the left side is of type A and the uh, left side and the right side is of type B. And the data type is either A and B. And then those two types can be anything. So in our case, if I go back, if I go back to our code, if I were to change it, uh, that my type is not maybe int anymore, but I will say, yes, I need to know what went wrong. So I would like to have either, then I can represent the right side. And that's typically the case that we use the right side to represent the current, the, the correct value. And we use the left side to represent some sort of error or some sort of uh, erroneous uh, struct. So in Golang, of course, it's, it's represented by error. And here I can represent it by, yeah error type or what, what i want you know sometimes we just go with string same as in golang we represent some sort of exceptional situations as as strings which is communicated to the user or to the programmer what went wrong right so i can convert my maybe int into my either int and then treat the left side as an error uh and then if um i'm returning um if I'm returning a particular uh, value out of those processing and I got a left side, 
uh, then the, I, I have to have a distinction because my data now has two sides. It has a left and right side. And I need to know on which side I am because on the right side, I want to do this. I want to do, um, uh, you know, the processing of my data. Uh, but if I got a left side, I need to decide, you know, how I'm dealing with it. And, um, the, you know, you, you can think of um, three possible ways of dealing, in, in our case, of dealing with errors. So if I have an error and I need to do something with this error, <clears throat> I can um, shortcut to the current error that, that is already there, right? So I can um, return, I, I basically kind of, uh, if, if I am on the left side, I return what, what's already there because I'm not doing any processing. I'm not doing any additional, uh, additional things here. Um, or what I can try is I can, if, if, I, if I have some sort of default value, even if there was an error, I can add my uh, processing on the default value uh, and kind of ignore the error. So depending, like it, it is up to you. It's the same as in Golang when we say, if there was an error, what do we do? Uh, do we panic or do we shortcut it to the error? Do we need to return or do we go with some sort of default value, right? Um, so you have to decide like what to do in each of those operations. And then in the case of uh, composing the, um, the operations, you need to decide what you will do with the collection. So you are uh, either kind of a shortcutting that it always kind of goes back to the first error and that's it, or you're accumulating the errors from the processing that, that you were doing. So I, I'm not gonna spend um, a lot of time discussing it here, but what you can do is you can go, um, uh, you can go to, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I will not write the other one. So if you go to students and then to Haskell, uh, you will see that we basically doing it here already. Uh, we're doing a certain uh, mechanism for accumulating errors uh, and we're doing it in a sort of a fancy way by collecting, not only shortcutting to the first error, but actually collecting the errors by, um, um, yeah, so here you, you see, for example, I'm kind of uh, doing some uh, uh, propagation of state and then the state on the left-hand side is the current state of the database together with some extra information. So I'm using a tuple. Um, but for the error propagation, what we're doing, we're using, um, instead of data either, we're using a data validation. And the data validation has slightly different behavior. So I will show you, I will show you here. So we are composing the, the, the validation of the, so, so validation is kind of like either, uh, but as you see, uh, instead of a string, I'm using an array of strings. Uh, and what it means is I can accumulate con consecutive errors in the structure such that I know all the errors that happened on top of a certain data structures that I was validating. And in, in that case, I was sort of val validating the name. And then I, because I have this uh, validation, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of a fancy mechanism again. So let's, let's show you here. So um, if I go here, uh, I have an either type, either, um, and I can have an either type, which is let's say string, like that's what we had there, string and int. Or I can say I have, um, I have a type, which is this, right? But because Haskell has carries, and because Haskell allows you to kind of operate on carries, I can have a partially fulfilled type as well. So I can have type, which is like this, right? So now I have a type, which tells me what sort of errors I'm dealing with, but it doesn't tell me what is the value, right? And I, you can sort of carry your type 
And that, that is the, it's not just a convention that we're using error on the left-hand side of either, but because we can carry the left-hand side of either and be polymorphic on the value, we can carry the same error type. So now this, this is my, you know, this is type my error type, right? And this is um, like a polymorphic type. So if I ask what, what, what is uh, my error type, <clears throat> it tells me, well, it is either string, but you see it's missing the second, the second parameter. I have to instantiate it for a particular value, but then I can have, I can have my error type for ints, or I can have my error type for strings, or I can have my error type for whatever, but the error is the same. So then I can chain operations on different values, but I maintain this sort of error uh, state across those values. So I can uh, return. So if I'm processing, you know, if I have my error type int and I'm doing some processing on it, so I, I have, you know, I have uh, a function which takes that and returns um, something, right? So I have a function which takes my error type. Um, no, no, I, I have a function which uh, takes some, some sort of maybe int or something, uh, and then it returns this. Uh, then I can uh, chain it in such a way that I can collect errors for different processings inside the same kind of mar error type. Uh, and that is what is happening inside this code, which we have for students. So the students is, is actually quite a complex um, uh, behavior of how you can manage errors. And this uh, either with the accumulation, um, it's already defined. So if you go again to, if we go to, to this one, and if you check uh, data validation, um, yeah, so I think that's the one which we need. Um, so validation is basically the same as either, and it's also the monoid, but the left side has a slightly different behavior. So the way uh, the monoid kind of uh, operates on the, on the value, like the, the way it kind of uh, chains operations can be different. And the either kind of uh, always shortcuts to the, uh, to the last, or let's so to say to the first uh, error, right? So if I have, um, yeah, uh, I, I, we need one more concept before I can show you. Um, so let's let's first go here. So um, with either types, as I said, like this type can be a, a, a list. Uh, and then what we can do is we can kind of, if we have a list of either's, uh, we can do, we can obtain all the lefts. So all the left sides or all the rights. And then we can check if given either is left or right. And then again, we have non-total extraction methods for, uh, actually those are, uh, those are total because they take a default value. And then if this either is not left, if this either is right, they will return the uh, default value. Uh, if this either is um, left, then they will return the left. So this is a total function because it takes the default value and it will never fail, even if this one is, um, even if this one is a right. So um, let me do this quickly. Uh, so module plus, data either and then if i have um if i have right you know uh, marius and if i say uh from left okay so let's do i don't want to be typing so i will do this so if i say from left uh and then you you do default value so you have joe and then you say m then because m is right not left it will return the default value right uh, but if you do Joe and from right, then uh, Joe is the default value, but M is right. So then it will return right. So this, <coughs> this is a total, total function because it returns for both left and right, uh, and it will never fail because uh, you have the default value. And then you can ask 
is right and so on, right? So it's the, uh, the normal behavior. Um, and then this one is quite useful because it operates on lists of, of, um, of uh, either types. So I can say I have uh, left, uh, for example, names. I can say Mariusz uh, and left is, and then I can have a right, oops, a right which is uh, 45 and a right which is one. And then on this list, I can do certain operations. So if I if this is my list, uh, I can you know show you, and you can see we have strings and numbers inside the list, but they are of type. So if I ask what is the type of L, it will tell me it's uh, either string and number, right? Numbers are polymorphic, so it, we don't know if it's the integers or integral or whatever. And then the strings are on the left-hand side. So lefts are text. And then, so I, I can say lefts from L and it gives me a list of all the lefts, right? Uh, so it says Marius is, and then I can say rights and it only gives me a list of all the numbers, right? So you can kind of do a more complex data structures and you can kind of uh, manipulate and do zip like processing uh, depending on the type which the uh, which the value carries, right? Um, I hope this is uh, no um, not too difficult. And then we have um, we have this a more complicated processing functions. So we have either, and then either takes two functions. The first one will be executed if either is left, and it will produce C. And then the second one will be executed on this argument if the either is B, if the either is right. And then both of them will always produce something of type C. So you can call um, you can call this to fork processing depending on the left or right of either, right? And that's what we were needing uh, when I wanted to show you this. Um, Oh, Jesus. Uh, I lost it. Yeah, I, 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 I killed it. Um, or was it in here? <clears throat> no. Yeah, I think so. So the idea was that we, um, okay, I know, I know. I need to open. So uh, we need to open that again quickly. And then what we were doing is we were we were converting my data to be um, an either string or int. And then here we were wondering, okay, now my data can be left or right, and I need to decide what to do, right? So in, in this case, if we did that, if we did this conversion from maybe int to either, either uh, string or int, and now what I would do is I would say either, and then I need to pass one function which is for the right side. And then I need to decide what to do if it's a left side, right? So here I will say, uh, what to do if I got left, right? And then if I got left, maybe I just uh, return left. And that's the default behavior of um, usually when you're composing either that if you hit some function which takes this and it has the left side, it just returns what the left side was. Right, so instead of doing this, I will kind of uh, return, um, um, like here you have to, uh, you know, write, uh, um, so I would get a value, which is the left side, and then I will return the left side directly, right? So I would say either left, in which case I just pass the left value out, or I got right and I do this processing, right? So if I already got an error, 
I will just propagate it through into my data, into my output, uh, in, in which case I can still do this processing. And then if there was uh, an error in the, in, in the multiplication, I will propagate it to here and then it will be propagated to here and then it will be kind of given out. So I will get the first error that I hit. And of course with uh, read maybe, now we need something which is like read either. And then if we have an error, we want to give it on the left-hand side, right? Okay, so I am going a little bit over time. So let's uh, wrap it up. Uh, we think, I think we really, close to the end. So I think there is one more question. No, there are two more questions, but they, they are simple. So questions for you and we go home. I mean, you, you will have a break before the cloud. So either is often used for, okay, that's super, super easy. We spent the last, you know, 20 minutes talking about it. Yes, you can use it for union-like data structure. Uh, but we usually don't do that. Why? So, so this question is not really about error handling because this is super easy. Why we usually don't do that? Why we usually don't um, do uh, either for union-like error handling, uh, union-like structs? The answer is that in Haskell, you don't have to, because if you want to have a union-like uh, data structure, you will basically say data and you will say my data and then you will have your constructors for union like i don't know uh you know field uh field one and then that might be an int and then you will say field two and that might be a string and you can define it yourself and then you can name it such that those names are meaningful like left and right yes they are sort of meaningful in a uh, in a sense of error handling because that's how we agreed, but they are not really meaningful if you're doing something else with it. If it is really a union, you should have names which describe what those fields are. And, and then this should be a type which describes what this union is for. So you usually just do it like this instead of abusing either for it, right? So we don't do this because that would smell, that would feel wrong. Okay, one more question. Oh, come on, come on. Okay, please work. I use stubborn Mentimeter. We want to hurry up and you don't want to work. Okay, that worked. Yes. Okay, so that that's uh, just to let you know that either is very common. You probably haven't used it uh, because you've been programming in Golang and C++, but actually either is very common in many programming languages uh, and it is available everywhere, right? So it is the same as a result in uh, Kotlin and Rust and um, all those programming languages have it. The annoying thing is, as I was telling you, that for example, in Rust, even though it exists in Rust, it is not a monoid, so you cannot do certain things on it. You cannot fmap function on, on top of it. You have to define it yourself. So, okay, and then there is, um... okay, so I will finish here. I have one more slide and there is one more topic. Uh, and we will uh, come back to it. I will close the Mentimeter now, um, but there is one more uh, extra topic that I need to tell you, and I will do it on, uh, on Monday. So sorry again for going over time. Um, I will not do this slide now because it is quite important, and we will come back to that on, um, on Monday, but I will close this Mentimeter because there's just one question left and one slide left. So that's it for today. Thank you. See you guys, enjoy the clouds.